doing nothing. I'm just sick and tired of doing household chores all day, every day. So why do you do them? Well, somebody has to. Besides, we're women, and we're considered to be weaker than men. Therefore, we must take care of the chores. It's not like we can pursue our dreams or vote or go to college. The chores are what we're made for. Well, that's just not right. When I grow up, I want to be a writer. Or maybe a teacher. Whatever I am, I know I can prove to the world that I am so much more than just a girl. Pink, you know how hard it is to get a career in writing. Journalism is a man's job. You'll be lucky enough to get an article on gardening or fashion. You'll see, Mom. Things will change. And if I have to be the one to change them, so be it. <coughs> It's so nice to finally meet America's best reporter, Nellie Bly. Oh, thank you. I'm so thrilled to be having a biography written about me. And who better for the job than you? Oh, please. Shall we start? Tell me about your childhood, where it all began. I was born in Cochran Mills, Pennsylvania on May 5th, 1864. I grew up during a time when women were discriminated against. They said that women were only good for house cleaning and childbearing and shouldn't even be given an education or the opportunity to vote. I knew I was born to prove those people wrong and give women the voice they needed. When I was six, I got a sudden interest in story writing. My mother would give me these lessons on how to stand out and make myself heard. I quickly earned the nickname Pink, for I wore pink clothes and showed among the rest of the girls dressed in regular calico. When my father tragically died, God bless his soul, I got a taste of reality which many people believe led me to remaking journalism and changing the world. My teeth chattered and my limbs were goose flushed and blue with cold. I suddenly got one after the other, three buckets of water over my head, ice cold water too, into my eyes, my ears, my nose, and my mouth. I think I experienced the sensation of a drowning person as I dragged me, gasping, shivering, and quaking from a tub. For once, I did look insane. When expecting torture would produce insanity quicker than this treatment, take a perfectly sane, healthy woman, shut her up and make her sit from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. on straight back benches. Do not allow her to talk or move during these hours. Do not give her any reading or let her know nothing of the world or its doings. Give her harsh treatment and bad food and just see how long it takes to make her insane. Two months would make her a mental and physical wreck. Now I'm lying, now I'm lying. Mind answering a few questions for me, miss? No, not at all. Tell me, how did you end up in that mental asylum? After submitting my resignation for my first newspaper, the Pittsburgh Dispatch, I moved to New York. Then I went door to door, rejection from rejection, just looking for a new job. Seeing what happened to my mother after a death and a divorce, I was determined to be able to support myself economically without the help of a husband or a man. Finally, I found myself in the office of John Cockrell, the editor of the New York World newspaper. I was immediately assigned to do an undercover report on Black Bells Island Insane Asylum. There had been rumors of horrible treatment and perfectly sane people getting thrown in there just because there were women that couldn't speak English. Not many thought I could do it, but I managed to get past the loads of professional doctors and even the court, tricking them into thinking that I was insane. So that fall of 1897, I wound up right in the, in the insane asylum with only a notebook and 10 harsh days ahead of me. You can read more about my experiences in my new novel, 10 Days in the Madhouse. Wow, Nellie, the articles you have released have launched jury investigations that are improving conditions for the mentally insane as we speak. All right, everyone's dying to know. Is Nellie Bly your real name or a pen name? It is a pen name that George Madden, the editor of my first newspaper, gave to me after the Nellie Bly song. The rumor is confirmed. Nellie Bly is a pen name. I have one final question for you today. What do you plan on doing next? I think it would be interesting to take a trip around the world. Maybe even beat Phileas Fogg's record of 80 days. That's impossible. A task only fit for the strongest of men. You will never make it. Very well then, start off a man the same day and watch me beat him. On November, on November 14, 1889, we saw Nellie Bly take off from Hoboken, New Jersey. She said her final goodbyes and hoped to be back in less than 80 days. 
Over the past 72 days, we have seen her land in France, Italy, London, Hong Kong, Singapore, Egypt, and finally, ladies and gentlemen, Nellie Bly has done it. She has made it around the world, all 21,740 miles, in only 72 days, 6 hours, and 11 minutes. Unbelievable! Finishing my trip around the world was a day to remember. The station was packed with thousands of people, and when I landed, one yell went up from them, and the cannons at Battery Fort Green boomed at the news of my arrival. I wanted to take my cap off and yell with the crowd, not because I had made it around the world in 72 days, but because I was home again. You must have felt so proud. So what did you do after all that? After resigning from the New York World newspaper in 1896, I married to Robert Seaman, the owner of Ironclad Manufacturers. After he died, I took over his business and became the nation's leading female industrialist of the time. I even designed my very own milk can, which was found very useful among others. But I just couldn't keep away from journalism. So in 1914, I got in contact with the New York Evening Journal while visiting a friend in Austria during the outbreak of World War I. I then began writing about my experiences at the war's front lines. Wow, Nellie, your story is truly inspirational. Thank you for your time. Nellie Bly wrote her articles Up Until Death on January 27, 1922. She was a leader among the world, inspiring women to believe in themselves like she inspired me. She showed first Pittsburgh, then New York, then the world that women were so much more than everyone thought. She was willing to go through four months of rejection, harsh treatment in a mental asylum, time in jail, and even in a factory just to prove that women deserve the same opportunities and treatment as men. She changed so many people's lives, and not only for women, but for the homeless, mentally insane, poor, and even animals. She even started her own generation of stunt reporting that is still used today. Nellie Bly had a passion for writing that was alive in her up until the day she died and what that passion she left behind a legacy. A legacy that is alive in women reporters all around the world. A legacy that can be seen with every news report and article published by women every single day. That legacy will forever be alive as women go above and beyond, changing the standards, stereotypes, and restrictions that once lived.